We are millennials and we get tired. I believe it's a plot. I believe it's a plot of screenwriters. Treat your friends as friends. They don't always have to hear how bad your life is. Sounds traumatic to me. So, what are we doing here, Anne? So, today we're looking at therapy culture-wise and from the point of view of our own experiences uh, we will maybe share our stories we will definitely check out some of the famous tv shows and uh, we're happy that we're here after a million years yeah oh my god like we we did our research we know that in order for a youtube podcast to kick off we need to do at least 10 videos we started in February, and this is a third one in August, like almost September. <laughs> I don't even have an explanation to that. I do. I don't even... No, 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 wait for it. What wait was for that? It. I do have an explanation. We are millennials, and we get tired. I mean, come on, we're real people. This is a real people podcast. We have jobs, we, we have family, we have cats, we have responsibilities. I mean... So, shall we start? Yeah, let, let, let's go for it. Um, so, I'm going to start first, because I think um, between us, among us two, between us two, uh, was the, the correct version. Uh, I, I think that I got into psychology a bit earlier than you did, because my mother started studying psychology, like, she started a, a degree when I was, like, maybe 14 years old. So, there were a lot of books scattered around the house. Um, that she was uh, studying and I was curious so I started reading like first year course book like general psychology um, and started learning things about that and like this kind of psychological lingo was in the family like for example um, I could never uh, answer a question as I don't know because my mom would never accept it as an answer they would be like why don't you know uh, it's a bit too much for a teenager, but yeah, I could never say I don't know. So I, we always had to find the root cause of my bad behavior. <laughs> yeah, I, I sounds I traumatic to me. Uh, yeah, it kind of was. But anyway, oh the God. good the good thing was that um, I was really like into psychology really early. But what happened next is that suddenly, uh, next to psychology, a new term appeared in our family and that was socionics socionics oh no you heard of that uh i did i wonder if people who are younger than us have heard about it because um i hope they haven't in fact because it can also be very traumatic um okay uh, can you describe a little bit for those who are not aware of socionics it, it was fun back then. It, it, it was fun back then. So socionics basically uh, tells you that there are 16 types of personalities and whoever you meet, you can put into this personality uh, judging by pretty much four personality traits. Are they extroverted or introverted? Are they logical or illogical? Are they like thinking about like um are they sensitive in terms of they really care about like their body and sensations or do they not care about that uh there is something for it but i cannot remember and basically you can type and analyze everyone judging by this four principles so suddenly all people who i knew were typed very strictly and i had to take a lot of tests like some were 80 questions some were like 200 questions to evaluate what kind of personality type you are. And well, uh, my mother decided, because she was a psychologist and like this was her assignment pretty much at university, to, to do the tests, evaluate people based on tests. And yeah, for a long time, I thought the psychologist basically doing tests and nothing more. Um, so yeah, I got, I got typecasted as a extroverted, ethical, um non-sensitive like I, I don't care about sensations in my body um and the type was called a jack london 
I really love Jack London as a writer. So um, I like this idea. But the more tasks I was doing, the more I was reading about the, the whole socionics thing, I realized that I'm not really that extroverted. I'm more introverted. Like I don't get energy from socializing with people. And my mom was really opposed to this idea. Like you cannot be introverted. You talk to people all the time. It's like, I'm not enjoying it that much. <laughs> So yeah, suddenly, like all the people around me were typed and analyzed based on this, like all my girlfriends, my boyfriend, and um, I really like this idea because it simplified things. So at some level, it was good because it made me think about other people in a way like, what are they? What are their personality types? So I think at young age, like 14, 15, 16, it really helped me. Even though now I completely disagree with the whole approach and I think it's uh, BS and that's completely anti-scientific. Uh, but it really helped at that time because you're trying to understand what the person is. So, yeah, but I, I think it was too much. <laughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken, this sort of typology was first of all intended for HRs to be able to identify if people are suitable for this or that role. I also vaguely re remember something at school because I don't believe that we had therapist or a counselor per se, but I do remember sort of tests trying to uh, like evaluate your like personality traits. I believe it was something like very similar to that, Myers-Briggs or Socionics. Uh, because they were trying like to help us to understand what we can do with our lives. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's more, more. It was more about like the therapist, the counselor at school would probably go and give you a test, and they will try to help you find a future career. Basically, what university you should go to. There was nothing about yeah. like your real personality, more like vocational test. Yeah, and uh, I believe that was it. Like at school, like my first years at university, that was basically it. And uh, I had no idea who the therapists are, what is therapy, how you can benefit from it. So that was completely non-existent, like I would say 15 years ago. Um, yeah, it's curious right now because right now it's everywhere and it's great that it's everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Like we knew that psychology existed. Like I read psychology books. I, I read books for students, but I had no idea what therapy was. Like yeah, this how it, term did not exist. How it applies to you? Because I also remember like maybe on my second or third year, this social psychology course that was like completely like so confusing. Oh my God. Because so it was about the behavior of groups of people and it included like these tests, you know, when you like change your opinion while, for example, you're looking at something red and the rest of the, the group says it's black and you like when you answer the last in the group, you would change your opinion. So it was stuff like that. And I was like, wow, psychology is tough. It's like harsh on you, like it like looks at you as the, I don't know, you're a moron. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, exactly. Honestly. Like the perception of psychology in early 2000s up until 2010 was like psychologist tells you who you are and that's it. You're that, you're this, he's that, he's that, and that's it. Like there's yeah. nothing you can do. We had no idea that it can be so much more. But I believe that for the rest of the world, it was not like that. It was already like super widespread because, I mean, talking about the US, so many of the um, people of the fathers of therapy of different methods mm -hmm. live there mm -hmm. and it's like in their culture. Um, so. 
yeah, I believe it's like more natural for them. But still, uh, like we got all our, like let's say, culture from American TV series. And of course, we are going to talk about Friends. Like, who do you take mm -hmm. us for? Uh, we are going to talk about Friends. And Friends Ever was the time. first depiction. Every time, <laughs> all the time. That's millennial anthem, Friends. <laughs> And um, the depiction of a therapist or a shrink, and I didn't even know the word shrink back then, uh, or therapy, to be honest, for me, it was like a psychologist. Um, the, the, the first depiction of him, uh, we're going to see what it looked like um, and what it was depicted in like, in like, not social media, uh, pop culture. Yeah, you're, you're so funny. <laughs> It's really funny. I wouldn't want to be there when, when the laughter stops. <laughs> whoa, whoa, back up there, Sparky. What did you mean by that? I mean, Bob, it just seems as though that maybe you have intimacy issues, you know, that you use your humor as a way of keeping people at a distance. Huh. I mean, hey, I just met you. I don't know you from Adam. Only child, right? <laughs> It's divorced before you hit puberty. Uh huh. How did you know that? It's textbook. Oh my god, it's so funny. I don't want to be there when the laughter stops. <laughs> I know, and I mean, it is. It is a very good joke. It is a very good joke. Um, because everybody in the group of friends understands that this therapist sees right through Chandler. He knows where his being funny comes as a, a coping mechanism and everybody knows that. He didn't know that and he feels really uncomfortable hearing this truth, uh, which kind of says a lot about the group. Like they're not really talking, having these deep conversations among each other. Like no one ever says like, look, Chandler, you might have some issues because of the divorce and like, look how you're using humor. They're not doing that. They're just not having those kind of conversations. But then again, this therapist sees him for the first time and like how rude that is to analyze someone. And I really think that it didn't do any justice for therapists. I cannot imagine, first of all, I cannot imagine any working person, any professional trying to do their job outside of their working hours. Exactly. So I'm not sure I believe it. Um, also, like it's highly, highly unethical, as you Very. said, to do something like that. I mean, I believe it can be a little bit hard to stop analyzing people for therapists i think i've seen some jokes or meme memes about it or maybe my therapist posted something about it uh like it's hard to stop i can't believe that but going like this you know on a person it's not something it, it, it's not something really cool to do but wait 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 it gets worse it does get worse. It's my friends. They they have a lagging problem with you, in that the, um, they don't. Actually, it's it's quite you know typical behavior when you have this kind of dysfunctional group dynamic. You know this kind of codependent, emotionally stunted, sitting in your stupid coffee house with your stupid big cups you're all like oh define me define me love me i need love what a meltdown exactly like a therapist <laughs> who snaps after hearing that some people who he already knows have a lot of issues don't like him how is that for an image of a therapist what was the motivation of uh the show writers and show runners to like show therapists like this way maybe maybe because a therapist is somebody who has who has access to like the deepest darkest you know places in your mind is somebody who scares you 
they creep you out. Like exactly, exactly. This is this is the idea of a therapist from 1995. It's a person who can read your mind, like read you like a textbook. And he will, and he will not stop even outside the office. <laughs> yeah, like they will, they they will hunt you down. <laughs> yeah, and push you like to face your imperfections. And then not care about it. Like he acts like he doesn't care about what is the impact of his words on the friends. Like he's just happy to be dating Phoebe and go to movies with her. So yeah, this was a uh, like he's a laughable character and obviously has his own issues because he snaps that easy. Um and yeah. This uh, this is 1995 for you. Therapy at its best. To me, he looks like a psychopath. <laughs> like, honestly. Uh, so fast forward into 2011, and we have another sitcom, How I Met Your Mother, presumably the sitcom that learned all the mistakes of um, friends. And they also have a therapist character uh, in the series. He's dating Robin. And finally, he's not just a one episode guy. He's there for the whole season. And we're kind of starting to see a real therapist, the one who would not act unethical as unethically as in as in France. So let's see how they did their homework. Enough times to know there is something unhealthy about you're not wanting to find out. Back me up here, Kev. No, 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 no. This real therapist won't risk upsetting his wonderful new girlfriend by analyzing her wonderful friends. No matter how mentally unbalanced they may be. <laughs> I hear you. I don't think you do. Right, so lesson learned, right? He's not gonna analyze anyone in the circle because that's gonna upset everyone. So you would think that he knows what he's doing, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, probably. Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful? Uh, he looks like somebody who's holding himself back like really, really hard, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember that episode. Well, I'm gonna remind you and we're gonna see what happens next in a moment. Uh, let's hope he's not gonna disappoint us. Let's hope. Kids, at that moment, Kevin thought back to his earlier rule. <laughs> This real therapist won't risk upsetting his wonderful new girlfriend by analyzing her wonderful friends. And threw it out the window. You're all the most codependent, incestuous, controlling group of people I've ever met! <laughs> by the way, you all look great, especially Robin. Oh. <sighs> what happened? What actually happened before this scene? Why, He's why is he freaking out? He's what? good enough. He he has seen a lot of red flags in their friends circle group dynamic. He's good enough. And he snapped. Again, like <sighs> the one in 1995. He just snapped. But why? But why? It's the same. I wonder. Oh my god. Have you ever met a snapping therapist? To be fair, I have never had I have never been friends with a therapist. I don't okay, know how they act. Okay, maybe we're missing a point. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever had friends as therapists, uh, I mean, they were not your therapists because that would be very unethical. But if you were ever friends with therapists, let us know. Do they act like that? Do they snap like that? Because that just... That doesn't yeah. seem right. I wonder. I wonder. And... Um, it's really bizarre how these two episodes of these two shows, they just, they're echoing. It's like basically yeah. the same thing 15 years yeah. later, right? Not, not like 11 plus 5, 16 years later. We still okay. have a therapist who snaps. <laughs> Who cannot take it anymore and starts analyzing without being asked to analyze, you know? I believe it's a plot. I believe it's a plot of screenwriters against therapists. I believe screenwriters have a lot of issues. Um, they are, like most of them, are in therapy 
and they're spending a lot of money. Maybe they're not getting satisfied with their therapist, uh, with their therapists, and they are like sublimating. Is there a such word in English? Broadcasting like this mm -hmm. thing into yeah. movies. It's so yeah. funny. Oh my god! And I mean, the like the 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 fandom, the viewership of both Friends and How I Met Your Mother is insane. So this is the the portrait of a therapist. Like they snap just like that. I mean, I I just I um. And obviously, in 2011, I myself, I didn't have much therapy experience. I did have one. You want to hear about it? Of course. Please tell me. Okay, so that was 2008. So pretty much three years before that episode aired. And I had a very, very bad breakup. breakup and I was really depressed. Like, I, I didn't know I was depressed, but I was not myself anymore i was really really sad all the time and my mother who was uh, who had a degree in psychology back then uh, by then uh, she convinced me to go see a therapist and uh, it was no ordinary therapist it was a therapist from her university like a real like guy with all the diplomas and degrees and whatnot and i had to go to his place for therapy and uh, it started really good it started really good because i went to him with basically broken self-esteem like i thought like i'm rubbish i am a big pile of shit. and suddenly he just started discovering that maybe my self-esteem was actually very high so high and so fragile that anything can ruin it so that was a very yeah, all of us are a little bit of a narcissist. Like I, I, I had no idea. I had no idea. I thought I was a pile of shit. And suddenly he started telling me that like it does look like you really think very high of yourself. And you're just not happy when other people also don't think that you're very good. <laughs> so it, it was a great learning experience for me. Like, I really enjoyed our sessions. The problem was that I was pretty much always late. Let's take away the Moscow traffic and how busy my schedule was. Sometimes I knew I was going to be late, but I was in the middle of something that at that point felt just more important. And you know, you were like what? Like what? You were 18, you were in a bar with your friend <laughs> who has this issue that she has to tell you about and you're discussing it over a glass of wine and like this seems the most important right now and I'm looking at my at, I'm looking at my watch and like I'm gonna be late but I cannot just leave the person like that and something just constantly had to come up you know 18 years old and then on seventh session I think I show up being late like maybe 15 20 minutes and it's not like I ever asked him to go over time. Like, I knew I was late. My session time is reduced automatically. And he didn't let me in. He didn't let me into the apartment. Uh, oh. He gave me, yep, like, the door locked. Like, here's your papers. This is my analyzing you in writing, in oh. handwriting, by the way. Oh. And he said, uh, from where I stand... You being late every time just tells me that you don't want this, you don't need this. Oh so my God. this is this is where our sessions stop. Wow. Now I see this correlates like very much with these two scenes that we've just seen. He snapped at you, no? I hurt his ego. Yeah. Yes. Wow, so fragile. Oh my god. I mean, a tenured professor at university with so many regalia and diplomas and degrees and this 18-year-old bitch just keeps getting late. Wow, it's so funny. Actually, I cannot imagine any of my therapists, any of the therapists I have been with, like, over the years, like, doing something like that to me. Of course, I mean, I didn't uh, do anything like that. 
I didn't like try being late them all the time. Yeah, again, you were a teenager, and I was. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that you still had a chance to benefit from that experience, from your first therapy experience. Because when I was a teenager, I didn't have any access to it. And uh, I think I will speak about it a little bit later. But it's great that during this several sessions, you had your insights, like you were able to reflect on yourself. Very helpful. Yeah, I felt dumped twice. Like <gasps> first, I had a breakup with my boyfriend. And then I was dumped by a therapist. I mean, yeah. But at that moment, kind of I don't think I I I didn't feel it at that moment. I've, I I definitely was taken aback. Like what what the fuck just happened? Um, but it didn't affect me badly in a way. Like I I didn't lose trust in therapists. I was just like, this is a bad one. And I think it's important that that early you can recognize a bad one because good ones do not behave like that. I had um, I had faith in therapy, but probably because of that, subconsciously, I didn't sign up for therapy until like 10 years after that. Like I was very, very opposed to the idea. Yeah, it's maybe because of that. I'm not sure. I couldn't I couldn't pinpoint. I couldn't say like, oh, he dumped me. So I'm not going to see a therapist again. Um, but maybe subconsciously it had some effect. My therapists, they all of them have been like extremely ethical, like uh, extremely understanding. And this is also like, this is not easy because you project all sort of things. Again, these are relationships, even yeah. like professional relationships, still relationships. And you're projecting a lot of things like from your own trauma and they are projecting a lot of things from their own trauma. They are also people. Of course, and uh, I think that, yeah, they are people, but just uh, the depiction of them in, in this episode of Friends and How I Met Your Mother shows them as bad people, <laughs> and there's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, so uh, do, we, do we have something to look forward to in uh, wow. culture? It is a very interesting question, because like, if you ask me, this goes on and on. Media and TV and Hollywood, they keep on demonizing therapists. Demonizing therapists, <laughs> that's what they're doing. Yes, so we do not agree. We do not stand with that. We want, no. we want people to be aware that getting therapy is a good way of dealing with your issues, with your problems, with your trauma, with your, I don't know, personal concerns, whatever. Or even no issues and no trauma, just, you know, um, treat your friends as friends. They don't always have to hear how bad your life is. Sometimes a professional can do that for you, and then you can just have a good time with your friend, like me and Anne are having right now. <laughs> Yes, I think we are the best advertisement for psychotherapy. Like, haven't argued, like, in how many years? Seven, eight? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, we were close. We, we, we were actually close to an argument, I think, like, three years ago. And then I had therapy. And then we had no arguments. <laughs> Look at that. What can be better? <laughs> <laughs>